Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Good morning, family. Good singing already. Wow, thank you. I'm always up for good singing. Hey, so we are going to uh, continue in our series on Sunday morning called Calling Upon the Name of the Lord, and I could not wait to get to this message because I love the name of Jesus. In fact, I'm not the only one, evidently. Jesus is the all-time most beloved name for Christ. It's no wonder it's so popular in music. It's no wonder it's so popular in poetry. It's the most verbalized name for Christ in prayer. It's the most verbalized name in testimony when people are giving their witness. Historians of the first century tell us that Jesus was one of the most popular names for Hebrew boys by the uh, middle of the second century, the use of the name kind of dropped off. And uh, the Jews stopped using the name because it associated with Christianity, which they opposed. And Christians refused to use it for the opposite reason, uh, out of reverence for the name and the person of Jesus Christ. And so they didn't use that name uh, by the second century. You know what? I, I love kind of, I, I guess you, I wouldn't say Bible trivia, because maybe some of you got like, nothing's trivial in the Bible. But, but I would say there are factoids, little pieces of tidbits that just fascinate me. And, and guess what? In the Gospels, the only person to look at Christ and call him by name Jesus was the thief on the cross. That's fascinating to me. In fact, he never used that name for himself until he, after he ascended and went back to heaven and he looked at Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus and I am Jesus and then in Revelation, I am Jesus. But he never referred to himself as that in the Gospels, at least on record. In the New Testament, Jesus is most found in the Gospels in the book of Acts. Uh, is, is used as much rarer as a standalone name in the, uh, what we call the epistles or the letters section of the New Testament. Uh, but what you will find in those letters of the New Testament is the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ. And uh, then it's Paul who wrote so many of those New Testament letters. He loved a formula, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is his uh, title. Jesus is his name, and Christ is his office. And you'll see that all the time used by Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now let's look into the meaning, the meaning of the word. When Mary and Joseph called their firstborn son, they called him Yeshua. And, and that's the Hebrew, which means Yahweh saves, or God the Savior. If anyone called him uh, that was speaking Greek, they would say, Jesus. And that's where we get our English word, Jesus. And so, Yeshua was where we get the name Joshua, the word, the tame, term Joshua. And, and Joshua was that very popular name uh, for uh, Hebrew boys uh, in Jesus' time. And, and, it, I think there's a lot of significance between the relationship or the commonality that Jesus and Joshua had. Joshua being Joshua, the son of none. That didn't mean he didn't have parents. All right, you guys are still alert. That's great. 
son of N-U-N. His father's name was Nun. And uh, he was the successor of Moses. And he took the, the uh, Israelites into the land of Canaan, the land of promise, and uh, led them to victory over that. And, 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 and that's the commonality. We see that both Yeshua and Yeshua, they were both warriors who led their people to victory. The first to hear the name Jesus as God's choice for his son is uh, Mary. In in Luke chapter 1, it says in verse 31 and 32, uh, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And so the very, very first person to hear the name Jesus selected as God's son is his mother, Mary. And then we just read uh, together with Dave in Matthew chapter 1 that uh, Joseph was the second one to have heard that that, uh, Mary's baby is to be called Jesus. It's a fascinating text where Joseph uh, finds out that his betrothed uh, is pregnant. And uh, he's troubled by that. He's trying to figure out how to put her away, it says, how to divorce her. And in that culture, if you were betrothed to be married, it was seen as an obligation, a legal obligation of marriage. And so Joseph is... is, uh, He's already starting to be an awesome guy. You know, what, what does the Old Testament law say about a woman who becomes pregnant outside of marriage? Yeah, it's pretty harsh. And, uh, and yet, you know, he, he's told that she's pregnant, and, uh, and he's struggling what to do about that. He was a just man and wanted to do it, you know, quietly. That's a, that's a tremendous amount of quality in a man right there. And, but in any event... Um, he gets visited by an angel, and, and the angel tells him in a dream to, to, to marry Mary, to wed her, and, and that she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, in this culture, fathers named their children. And so Joseph is going to be responsible for naming this baby. And so he is told by the angel to name him Jesus because he will uh, save his people from their sin. So Yahweh, the Savior, Yeshua, is all tied up in the name. It's his identity, it's his concern, and it's his mission. Which leads to a point that needs to be stated, and that is we needed saving you know our current society and culture and education system doesn't think that you need to be saved in in our current day and time we're being told by all the great authorities and voices in our culture that you're not really a sinner that's an antiquated term you're 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 just a human and you're okay the way you are you might have a disorder. Uh, you might have a defect of character. You might have aberrations. They like that word. But we have dropped the word sin out of our courtrooms. We've dropped the word sin out of our classrooms. And so people in our culture, they don't feel lost, do they? Yes or no? They don't. Hey, if you want to get into that, that's great. You start talking about sin and how people are sinners and people need to be saved, you're going to find yourself in opposition with people who have been uh, indoctrinated that they aren't sinners and there is no sin to worry about. But the Bible makes it so clear that we are not only sinners, but we need saving. 
And when God made man and woman in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27, it said, So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And since God is holy, that means that when he created Adam and Eve and made Adam and Eve, he made them holy in his image. But let's remember that holiness was conditional. And it ended the moment that they broke God's commandments and ate the one fruit that he told them not to do. And when they sinned, two kinds of death resulted. One was immediate, and that was a spiritual death. Because in the Bible, the word death means separation. Just as the body apart from the spirit is dead, James says. So separation is what the word death means. And in the moment that they sinned, they were separated from God spiritually. And eventually, they would be separated from their souls and their body. They would die physically. And so, in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Every single one of us made that choice, did we not? Thank you. Five honest answers. Every single person in this room that's old enough to know the commandments of God has broken God's commands by choice. That's what sin is. It's lawlessness. So we needed saving. We're not okay. We have to be redeemed because we are sinful. Now, because the Savior is going to save us from sin, he himself had to be sinless. Does that make sense? I hope so. He had to be a lamb without blemish. He couldn't die for our sin if he had sin on himself. Who would die for him? Answer? No one. And if Jesus sinned, what would happen to all of you? Uh, same thing would happen to me. Like, that's uh, baseball. Uh, no, okay. Not safe, not safe, not safe. Uh, edit that YouTube video. That doesn't make sense. All right. Our Savior had to be sinless, which means Jesus never sinned. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. 1 Peter 2, 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And so Jesus was sinless, and that's what qualified him to be Savior. And not only uh, is Christ our Savior, listen to me, he is the only Savior. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 4, if you... Acts chapter 4, the situation is, is that the apostles are now preaching in Jerusalem and they're healing people and there's this cripple who's never walked and, and Peter and John uh, uh, are arrested because they healed this, this man and, and uh, they're, before, they're right in front of the same people that, that were responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. And, and in verse 7, they... they they want to know by what power or name they healed this crippled man. And so it says in verse 10, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, woo, that's a, what do you call that? I call that a torpedo is what I call that. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, 
By him, this man is standing before you as well. This Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, ouch, the builders which have become the cornerstone. And watch here, verse 12. This is awesome. There is salvation in no one else. Amen. And watch. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other Savior. There's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's what happens when you're with Jesus. You no longer look like a common, ignorant person. And so it says, But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, And when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, verse 16, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that is a notable sign been performed through them is evident to all inhabitants in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to do what? Do not any longer speak in his name. So... Verse 18, they called him and charged him not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Well, let's just see how that turned out. Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than men, you must judge. There's a subtext to that, isn't there? Say yes. We're not listening to you. We're listening to God first. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And they threatened them, and they let them go. And they said, "Mm -mm, no, no, we're not going to stop. So what, what did Jesus have to do to be our Savior? Well, he had to do the unimaginable. The Son of God took upon himself the sin penalty that that we are guilty of so that we could go free. Have you ever heard in the Bible it says, for the wages of sin is death? You have? Have you ever thought about who had to, how those wages were paid? Ah, the wages of sin is death. Now we always think, Okay, because we've been sinning, we've earned that paycheck. There's all kinds of truth to that, and that'll preach. But have you ever thought of the other factor? Who paid that? Who paid those wages? Ah, it was Jesus. Our death penalty was placed upon God's Son, and that, my friend, is what actually killed him. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, look at this verse. It's so powerful. I've preached it enough, and I'm not going to be done preaching it. Next, next slide, please. It says, God made him, who's that? Jesus, who had no sin. We just saw two other verses that substantiated that he was not a sinner. To be sin for us. When did that happen? Everybody go like this. Everybody, ready? One, two, three. That's when it happened. When did him who had no sin become sin for us on the cross so that we might become the righteousness of God? So the cross didn't kill Jesus. The cross is where he died. The nails didn't kill him. The thorn didn't kill him, the flogging didn't kill him, but he died nailed to a cross after being flogged, but he didn't shed his blood in that. He died on the cross when God punished him instead of us, and that's what took his life. And the guy, the professional executioner, was so shocked that he was dead after six hours, took his spear and shoved it up into his rib cage and pulled it out. And that's when he shed his blood. Listen to me now. He shed it in his death. 
The cross is where he died, but I need you to understand the cross didn't kill him. You did. And I did. And you think that's unthinkable? God the Father did. When he punished him instead of us and it took his life, it was the Father that made that happen. Boy, that'll, that'll get you through lunch, won't it? Ooh, that's deep. So, here's another unimaginable thought. It's found in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children uh, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is who? Who's that talking about? It's talking about the devil. The word it became flesh in order to destroy the devil. Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy in the Bible, and it basically says a human being is the one who's going to defeat the serpent. Now, in verse 15, it says that not only did he come to destroy the devil, who has the power of death, which is a frightening idea, and verse 15, and deliver those who all through their deliver those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. So the other reason why he became flesh was to save us from being afraid to die. And there's few things in this world with all these philosophies and all that worldview that I just mentioned earlier, and people are terrified of death. They're terrified of it. And, I, you know, when I've been in a hospice situation, I've seen two kinds of Christians. Those who are anxious, those who are agitated, I've seen people afraid. I've even seen people terrified laying in that bed, and they are terrified. They do not know what's going to happen to them when their heart stops. Then there are those that I have visited that knew they were at the end of their life, and they were going to pass into eternity, and they were calm. They were welcoming. My last conversation with Stan was filled with his hope, knowing that he was going to leave soon, and yet he made sure I understood that he couldn't wait to get there. Carl Wallers. Man, I don't know anybody who waited longer than Carl Wallers to get there, do you? I mean, he waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. How many prayers did he offer? God, I'm ready. God, I am ready. God, I am ready. He wasn't terrified. He wasn't frightened. He was wanting to go. And right now, I'm telling you what, he's having a good day. And he's not alone. Bonnie Brown, completely calm, getting ready to go. Jim Browning, completely calm, looking forward to it. Hank Lawson, the last thing that we heard him say is, praise God, hallelujah, and then he died. That's not a terrified, oh, no, I don't know what's going to happen to me. That's a person who says, I can't wait to get there. And Jesus is the only one that can give you that. Set you free from your paranoia about dying. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen to a Christian? Die and go to heaven? That ain't that bad. Amen. What are you going to do? Take my life? Well, you're just going to vault me into the arms of God. That's what Jesus can do. How did he make this freedom possible? He had to kill death. He, he had to kill death dead. He had to kill death dead by dying. That's how it happened. So let me finish up with one thing that when I thought about Jesus' name, I, I, was, I was just thinking, how is that used today? How is that used? Well, the most common way it's used today in the church is that we conclude our prayers with it, right? And now, is this something that's said in order for our prayers to actually be heard? Is this something that we, we kind of see as the stamp on the envelope and it won't quite make it to the sender unless we say that on there? Is it, is it um, 
uh, sort of like uh, wrong if you don't close your prayer with that formula. Now, the reason for this uh, uh, is really found in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Christ himself said, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that, that my Father may be glorified in the Son, and if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And, and you know, he's speaking to the apostles directly. There's probably some application, obviously, to that. What, what bothers me is how many people misuse this idea, this, this idea that if I say this formula, then God's obligated. I, I just hate that. I really just, it really bothers me. These, these fraudulent faith healers are commanding sickness to be gone in the name of Jesus. Or, or these prosperity preachers that you find online that, that declare financial blessing uh, uh, for those who pay them to pray for them in Jesus' name to have material blessings. That's how those ministries are formulated. Well, when I see those guys talking like that on TV and on, the, on, on YouTube, uh, the prosperity preachers, I keep thinking about James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So to think that we can just invoke the name of Jesus and, and, and simply fulfill our passions is, is to cheapen what God did on the cross. Amen? Now, praying in Jesus' name is meaningful. Since Christ went back to heaven, he's now ascended to the right hand of God, he is called our intercessor or our mediator. Therefore, when we're praying in his name, we do so knowing that by being in Christ, we are being heard. We also know that, that God the Father wouldn't give us a second of his attention if we didn't come in the name of Jesus, if we didn't come in who Jesus was. We don't have the right to approach a holy God in prayer. Another thing that it means by praying in the Jesus' name means I submit to his will. 1 John 5, 14, it says, This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And verse 15, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. That's all of us. So praying in Jesus' name means I am, I am aligned with his will. Thirdly, we pray in the authority and the power of Jesus' name. We are calling upon his mercy. We're calling upon his blessings. We're calling upon his his presence in heaven. So, I've come to the conclusion, oh boy, I've come to the conclusion that if you don't finish your prayer saying in Jesus' name that it's okay. I've come to the conclusion that it's not mandatory. I'll share with you why it's okay to say a prayer, and when you're done, just say amen. I have reasons for this. You ready? I looked up every prayer in the New Testament, and guess what I didn't find? That's right. There's not a single prayer in the New Testament, obviously not in the Old Testament, that says, in Jesus' name, amen. There's not a single one. Do you think that means it's okay? Should we pray in Jesus' name? Yes. Should we say, in Jesus' name, amen? Sure. Do we have to? I don't think so. And so... I'm just saying amen. It was really weird at first, but now I really like it. I say, you know, I say them both, obviously. All right, all right, let's finish up. It's a wonder. Well, it is no wonder. It's no wonder why Jesus, as the name, is so highly revered and has been so for 2,000 years. I mean, there's no name that 
permeates our hymnal. The songs that are projected on our screen are saturated with the name of Jesus. And, and it, I kind of find it when people are teaching, they're using the name Christ, but when they're expressing their love, they use the name Jesus. And it's the name that provides salvation. It's the name that sustains us when we face struggles and heartache. It's the one that we call upon when we are unable. <coughs> it's the one that promises hope. It is his name that gives us confidence that when we enter into God's presence, we will be in a place of grace. When we pray and approach God, we are praying in the name of Jesus through the authority, through the presence, through the mediation. And when we do so, we will receive mercy in our time of need. You know, somebody wrote a great song. There's just something about that name. Isn't there? Isn't there? Let's stand up and let's sing that. If you have something you need to share with us today, let us know. There's just something about that name.